Our guest today is Pierre Ferrari, who's the president and CEO of Heifer International, an organization on a mission to end hunger and poverty by supporting and investing alongside local farmers and their communities. Pierre's 40 years of business experience are now being put into his passion for social issues at Heifer. You can find his recent opinion pieces in Time Magazine with Chef Tom Colicchio, where he talks about the fixes we need to make to our food system. And in a recent Fast Company article, he discusses ethical meat standards. Pierre and his wife, Kim, have been fans of Serenby for years and were delighted that they've recently made the move here full time. Just enjoy the, the, the sights, the trees, listen for the animals. That is what I recommend. That's why, you know, at my, my house, I literally can trip over my fence and I'm in the forest, which is one of the reasons I bought, we bought this house and uh, just love the forest. All right. Well, Pierre, welcome to Serenby Stories. We thank you for making the time for us today. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. And we've got Steve here as well, of course. Good afternoon. Nice to uh, have a chat on Several of the things. I know. Even though we're all here in Serenby, we're all on Zoom still. Soon we'll all have vaccines, right? Yeah. I've got vaccine. I'm vaccinated. Oh, wonderful. Well, and I think, Steve, you have your first one, yes? I've got mine, right? Due to get my second. Fulton County just started 55 plus this week. So I'm close. I'm close. So believe it or not, the reason I got vaccinated is that HEFA, all HEFA employees are guaranteed, are considered to be uh, necessary or essential workers because we're involved with farming. Wonderful. How about that? That's great. Isn't that incredible? Yes. That's incredible. Yeah. So whether it's accounts payable or it's actually the farmers, we qualify. I know. We have an organic <laughs> farm here. I wonder if I could I know you do. Because I, I do marketing. Am I essential? We can <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, 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 we yeah. can argue that. <laughs> um, so, Pierre, one of the first things we've been asking everybody is, how did you discover Serenby and how, how did you find your way here um, to be our neighbor? Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a long story, so I'll keep it <laughs> short. Uh, my wife was, Kimberly, mm-hmm. was uh, an advertising executive. And she and her boss and mentor came here. And I think, Steve, I think they sold you the farm, right? They sold uh, you the yeah. end. That's right. It, it, well, it was Dick Henderson. Uh, Dick was Henderson. The, owner of the farm. Yeah. Yeah. And and then the, the partner, um, uh, uh, Drake, uh, his wife was a, a real estate agent. And she's the That's one right. who actually showed it to us. Small world, isn't it? Small world. And, <laughs> and you know, it, Kimberly talks about her relationship with Dick Henderson and the work that they did together and, and the fact that they came down here and they looked at the farm when, you know, it really was pretty, uh, well, what, what's the right word at the time? You it, know, was it, basic. Was, it was historic. Basic. And basic. There we go. That's a good word. <laughs> and this is 1991 for those listening in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 1991. And uh, Henderson decided to sell that and move to another place, I think, on the coast somewhere. But anyway, that's how it all started. That's how we got acquainted. And then when I married Kimberly much later in 2003, mm-hmm. uh, she said, oh, let's go to Serenby and have a look what's going on. And she told me the story. And so it was a long walk to actually ultimately we bought a farmette. Uh, we sold the farmette because I, I really didn't want to build anything. I just don't think that. I think I don't know if our marriage would have stood it. <laughs> 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 um, probably would, but I don't know. But anyway, so we ended up. Um, buying this house, which we absolutely love. We love the community. and But that's how I got acquainted. Yeah, yeah you guys have... The very root of Serenby. Yeah, the, the early root. days. <laughs> People have various paths. You have one of the longest paths. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do. Definitely. Yeah. Pierre, where are you originally from? Yeah, so I was born, believe it or not, in the Central African country of, at the time, the Belgian Congo. Okay. And... Uh, then it became Zaire, and now it's the Democratic Republic of Congo. <laughs> anyway, uh, through a variety of changes, which have to do with independence and military military insurgencies and everything else, my father and my parents actually decided that we needed to be educated somewhere other than Africa. And we, both, we my sister and I were both sent to England. This is another long story I won't bore you with. 
mm-hmm. to get educated. And that's where I went to basically middle school, high school and university. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm not, I, I've got a British passport, but I don't feel British um, for obvious reasons. So I decided to make, uh, you know, seek seek better better opportunities in the United States as an immigrant. So I landed off the plane in 1974, went to Harvard Business School, mm-hmm. uh, got myself an MBA, and then got hired by the Coca-Cola Company, ah, which, our hometown. which brought me yeah. to Atlanta. Okay. Yeah. So what kind of work were you doing? Uh, at the time, my first job was in the uh, mergers and acquisition department. Mm-hmm which I, I liked plenty well, but uh, one of the strategies that the board of directors followed that the M&A department, say, recommended a series of acquisitions, which we did, and then they turned around and said, well, you, you made all the forecasts. Now we're going to give you a responsibility for meeting those forecasts. Go run the businesses. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, so suddenly these spreadsheets that we were just, you know, we spent a lot of time on these things. This is before Excel worksheets. Uh, you know, became the reality of our lives. Anyway, I ended up uh, doing that. So I ended up in marketing uh, okay. from M&A work to marketing, which of course is what Coca-Cola does. Yep. So I spent 20 years with the marketing in marketing at Coca-Cola. Uh, I had various jobs and ended up back here in Atlanta in 1990. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've, I've not left. So... So you were here That's, for the Olympics. I was, that here was for an the Olympics. exciting time. Very much an exciting time. And my association with Coca-Cola actually gave me tremendous access, which was nice. I bet. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. And you and Steve had not crossed paths at that time. No, no, no. My, it's really my wife's crossing paths with Steve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I think when we came down, began to look around uh, in, you know, 15, 14, mm-hmm. I think... Uh, Steve, at some point, you know, we had a cup of coffee together and, you know, we reminisced a little bit and hanging so, around, hanging time, around. I mean, between being in Atlanta all those years and the Coca-Cola and the city, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of cross paths, but yeah, really, you know, coffee until you start coming back. Yeah. And the peasant restaurants. I remember that the one on Peachtree right down there. We used to go there quite frequently. Um, we so, were the neighborhood dining room for Coca-Cola in those days. You were, you were. Uh, especially for dinner, you know, quick dinner. We went over to Peach. We'd go to go with the present pleasant and uh, have a scallopini or whatever. I forget the dishes that we had. You probably <laughs> remember the menu. But I'm trying to remember. Yeah. <laughs> and we actually lived in Ensley Park, which, of course, is just around the corner. Yep. Uh, yep. Square yeah. in the, yeah, the country yep. place. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So how, how did you go from Coca-Cola to your current role at Heifer, was that a direct line or? Um... No, it was not a direct line. I left Coke in 95. Okay. Uh, and uh, I decided that uh, I wanted to do something more more interesting in a way than just peddling a lot of uh, carbonated soft drinks. And uh, so I ended up with a, a group of friends slash investors and we built a, venture, a little venture capital firm uh, whose, objection, whose objective was to invest in distressed communities to try and build businesses and wealth and jobs. Mm. And so I did that for many years, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, I invested primarily, I, there's some side investment, but primarily in five companies. Mm-hmm. Three went bankrupt uh, and two went very well. So, oh, very good. That's, that's a pretty decent um, statistics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it, it was okay. And uh, the investors, the investors were really not in this to make money. So Ultimately, we gave all the profit that we generated back into the communities in various ways. I don't know if you ever heard of Guayaquil Yerba Mate. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, I have. So that's one of the companies we invested in, and uh, and it's been very successful. Wow. And all of the profits out of that have gone back into buying land in Argentina to reforest and, re- and rework the forest so that they could grow biodynamic yerba mate. Wow. So that's the kind of work that, that I was doing. And then um, and I was doing okay. And then this uh, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, an executive search executive in Atlanta, uh, called me. No, didn't call me. I met somewhere. We met, uh, we met at Oglethorpe University. It was an Oglethorpe University meeting. And she came up, running up to me and said, there's a job for you. You need to take that job. 
<laughs> well, I said, well, I don't you know. Can I take it? Okay. Well, they, they said, Joe, you need to interview. And it was a half a job. Okay. And uh, I sort of, you know, dug around and looked around and got some data. And I said, you know, I think there's something really interesting to be done there. And so I applied. Kim and I were actually in France at the time when the application went through. Did it all online. It felt like a, a precursor to what we're doing now. Yeah. Anyway, it was all online. I got interviewed. I was in Marseille, and we were interviewed online by, by very, video and everything else. Anyway, very I, ended up, I ended up getting the job, and I really have loved this job. This has been a great job. Yeah, so tell us, um, for those who don't know about Heifer, um, I, I had been aware of it um, through my mother-in-law, who that was her mm. Christmas gift choice every year. Yeah. Every year, wow, great. Every year, that's what she she wanted um, and still does. Um, but tell the listeners a little bit about Heifer International and why you decided to work there. Yeah. So we're a development organization. We work mostly overseas, although we do work a little bit in the U.S. And it's actually linked to the work that we're doing here at Helen Serenby. We have a 1,200-acre ranch. Mm-hmm. We are a... Uh, a, a um, a regenerative farming community mm-hmm. uh, in, in, in Perryville, Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And we do mostly livestock, but we do some vegetable. We do cattle, pork, chickens, and we're a savory hub, uh, mm-hmm. which I think you know by savory here as well. So we, we, we practice very, uh, you know, biophilic practices in our ranch. Mm-hmm. And, and Steve, if you went to the half a ranch, I think you'd, it recognize everything that you know you do here at the farm as well. We're not organic. The, the, the certification for organic is, in our opinion, too too onerous and raises costs. Well, you're probably organic. You're just not certified. We are exactly. We are totally organic and you know non-GMO, et cetera, et cetera. I call it the totally politically correct approach to farming. <laughs> um, without the label. <laughs> without the label. Now we do. We're linked up to a, a whole system. We grow, we have uh, farmers in a co-op, we're part of the co-op. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have processing plants mm. uh, called Cypress Valley. So we do our own processing. We pay our, we pay our labor a living wage. Mm-hmm. And we very, we take, we really take care of our labor. Uh, and then, um, and this is all that links in to an e-commerce operation called Grassroots Co-op, also mm. co-ops. So all of it is very uh, community oriented and all of the all of the value is captured by the community in one way or the other and so if you want to buy some high quality beef or pork or chicken or you know sausage or something go to grassroots co-op so that particular enterprise is what we're heifer is doing in the united states mm-hmm. uh, we're working with actually the corpo indians in terms of processing their beef and we're now working with a african-american community in mississippi to develop uh a supply of pork. And uh, so far, the early read is very good. Now, overseas, we work with smallholder farmers, probably the poorest of the poor. Mm-hmm. Most farmers we work with are farming, not because they want to be farmers, but simply that's the only way they can survive is by growing their own food. Mm-hmm. And what we do is uh, work with them, organize, mobilize the farmers in a variety of ways into co-ops and value chains. Mm-hmm. There is no, There is no money in being a producer, uh, all of them. I mean, if you if you take coffee or you take goats or you take dairy, producing the actual raw commodity that makes the whole value chain work mm-hmm. is not where the money is. The money is generally at the other side of the value chain, which is retail or, mm-hmm. or you know, some kind of processing and, and distribution. Mm-hmm. So we 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 work with the communities through mobilization. We mobilize large numbers of farmers, you know, hundreds of thousands of farmers so that they can actually engage in the value chain, but not just as producers, but also as processors and distributors. And in some cases, uh, the, the, the communities will actually get into retail as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, the, in Ecuador, uh, the farms we work with, the vegetable, mostly vegetable and fruit farmers we work there, have decided to open up their own restaurants and their own retail operations because that's where the money is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, But we've teach them all that. We show them... Uh, where the money is, you mm-hmm. know, if the, and we provide capital, we provide training, uh, not necessarily by providing, I don't mean that we necessarily give it to them, but we mobilize it, we organize it, we provide guarantees if necessary. 
So it's a whole system approach to making sure the farmers can escape poverty. So our, our, our North Star is what we call living income for the farmers. Mm-hmm. And we've got a pretty substantial a protocol on how to calculate that. What is a living income for a farmer in Ecuador or Rwanda or, or Senegal or whatever? Right. And so the, the goal of the project always is, how do we get you there? How do we get you to a living income, which is basically a life of dignity? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the work that we do. And we work with livestock happens to be in most countries. If that I don't know of a country where we operate, where livestock is not the single most profitable way of making a living as a farmer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we work with, you know, dairy and pork and goats mm-hmm. and chickens and uh, snails and all sorts of <laughs> livestock, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, some, you know, I mean, like, uh, for example, in, in Ghana, a particular type of snail is is very profitable for the farmers, but they have they have to be trained on how to do it right and uh, protect, you know, the Make sure the snails are healthy and make sure that uh, they're safe to eat, et cetera, et cetera. So right. we, you, you give us a species, and I think generally we know somebody in the organization that knows how to raise them. Doing problem. something with it. Well, and, and I think you're, um, the one line that, that really struck me is the goal or objective, ending hunger and poverty while right. caring for the earth. Right. I thought so, that was beautiful. So caring for the earth, we use uh, what we call uh, climate smart agriculture. Okay. Uh, that's the approach. And regenerative farming is one of those approaches, of course, mm-hmm. by using livestock, especially the waste from livestock, into, you know, back into the ground. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I always say we, we operate with uh, working with farmers, we operate with sort of three uh, mir- and not miracles. And I don't mean that in a, in a religious sense, but one is the, the miracle of photosynthesis, mm-hmm. the actual conversion of sunlight, you know, with chlorophyll into either food that can be eaten or food by humans or food that can be eaten by animals. Mm-hmm. And that's the second miracle, which is enteric digestion, which is what cows, uh, you know, ruminant digestion, which is what cows and Mm-hmm. Uh, horses and goats and sheep and everything else. That's another amazing miracle of biology that they convert inedible food for us into edible, you know, meat and milk and et cetera. Mm-hmm. So that's, and then the third miracle is the miracle of reproduction, mm-hmm. right? These animals reproduce. Right. And that is not to be underestimated because that's actually one of the major sources of profit for farmers of livestock, right? Right. So those three combinate the three combinations of quote unquote miracles uh, makes it possible to actually take these farmers out of poverty, especially mm-hmm. if the product of those activities is marketed uh, all the way down to you know almost retail. Yeah. Well, and I know Steve and I talk about you know the ecosystem, and so you're saying sort of yeah. it's system design. And so when we have our farmers here, that's just the beginning to your point. I yeah. thought that was interesting mm-hmm. to hear that the producer, the producing isn't really making the money. You need the whole ecosystem right. in order to make the money. And and I had never really heard or thought about that until Steve sort of brought that into my Yeah. Head so thing. you do if you do the analysis of any value chain, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you think about the farm here mm-hmm. and the CSA, right? The CSA okay. Because they sell directly to us. Yep. Is the pro- is their profitable activity, and the farmers market everything else. But if they were to sell to a wholesaler, they would not make money, mm-hmm. or it would be very hard to make money, right. especially at the, at the scale at which they operate. Mm-hmm. You can only make money if you're you know operating at you know, two hundred acres of or what I don't know what the economic size is, but it's much bigger than what we've got here. Mm-hmm. So by going to CSA and market and farmers market everything else, you're now moving you're capturing the value close to the final sale to consumers. Mm-hmm. That's where the money is. Yeah. It's not, it's not in, 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 in hoeing the land. It just isn't. Just there is, I don't know of any crop except marijuana where the producer <laughs> makes money. That's interesting. There isn't, there isn't one. Well, and, 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 and is it the hemp or is it the marijuana? Is it the, no, actual- I'm talking about drugs. I'm yeah, talking drugs. about drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a product. There was a product for a time that you could actually make money as a producer, and it was a uh, an oil, a, a seed that produced an oil that was used in fracking. Oh. And so I was in Rajasthan, India, right? Uh-huh. And we were working on a goat project over there. And then 
we came across this village and all the homes were new. The roofs were new. Uh, you know, that you, we, we stopped and, you know, there was, there was water, the wells had been dug. I said, what the hell's going on here? Well, they were producing the seed that was being sold at an incredibly high price because of fracking going on in Pennsylvania. Right. Uh, and so they were selling at a very high price, which didn't last long because ultimately uh, the natural product got substituted by something synthetic. They found an alternative, but, you know, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, the marketplace is so important. Yeah. Um, whether yeah. that's the consumer or the restaurants or the chefs. Um, you talk a lot about so so it's interesting, like your agriculture time started with the VC, it sounds like with the land in right. Argentina, but has been a through um, you know, kind of thread to today. And and one of the things that I was really fascinated with is you just put out an opinion piece um or an article with um chef Tom Calicchio um yeah. in January. Will you will you talk to us a little bit about it? It was really wonderful talking about how we need the political will to make a lot of changes in the food system. Yeah, so you know the, <laughs> the American <laughs> food yeah, it's a long subject. Um, <laughs> it is a big so the, topic, the, yeah. Yeah, the, the 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 American food system has been uh, dominated and incented to become increasingly monopolized, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. that's at the production level, it's at the processing level, the transportation level. You know, there isn't a place where the American food system is not functioning essentially what is what the economists call rent seeking behavior, which is uh, oligopolistic or capital or, or, or monopolistic behavior. Mm-hmm. And we've created that. And I'll also say, I will also say that the American food system is feeding 335 million people every day, you know, three meals a day. Yes. So it's not as if it's, inco- it's not an incompetent system. It's actually an incredibly efficient system. Mm-hmm. But it, it doesn't allow for the kind of work that we do here at Serenby, which is more, you know, biophilic and interested in, in the quality of the soil and quality of life and uh, and elimination of, of you know the, of, of uh, elimination of all sorts of toxic chemicals that are poured into our land mm-hmm. into our streams. That's the what is what is called by economists externalities. Yep. So this this oligopolistic behavior, and that's I think that came up in in the in the in the, in the conversation I had with Tom. You know, you've got this massive system that feeds us, but the externalities of that system are extremely damaging and toxic. Mm-hmm. So how do we find a middle way that we are need to feed 335 million people plus many others outside of the United States mm-hmm. and yet regenerate our soil, protect our land, protect our forest, protect our people? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I mean, the use of glyphosate and, or Roundup in, in, uh, in all of in too much agriculture is just, I mean, the consequences are building up, you know. Yes, they are. And we're so. hearing more and more about them. When we have, well, he's not new, right? Vilsack is he, for his second term. And I know he's right. done some good work with um, farmers, underserved farmers in the past. But do we think that, that this is an initiative of the Biden administration in Vilsack? Um, not yes. to get too political, but I, I do think like we, the people, can put pressure on our representatives to focus yeah. on different things. So, you know, the approach has got to be, I mean, if you, if you sit down with uh, the major companies, whether it be Tyson or Cargill or BDS and, and some other companies, you know, they will go back and say, well, we, we understand the problems that have been co- caused, but how do we produce food at the scale that's needed? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, for example, the processing of beef of cattle into uh, one of our favorite foods, which is steak. Mm-hmm. You know, how do we manage that in a way that's humane for the animals? You know, uh, protecting of the of the soil, et cetera, et cetera. There are ways to do it, but it takes investment, takes time, and it takes convincing a large number of farmers and ranchers and everything else that regenerative farming and soil management is actually a better way to go than what they're doing. So it's both policy issues mm-hmm. and also, you know, convincing people who are who are farmers. That's what and that's one of the things that we're doing in Arkansas. We're showing how you could manage cattle mm-hmm. in a soil enhancement, soil recreating manner. Uh, there's a whole 
there's a whole movement. Uh, again, the Savory Institute is one approach that we are utilizing and actually are taking over to Africa, both in Senegal and Nigeria. Mm-hmm. That the, the soil there, so this could be done at scale. I'm not talking about 200 heads of cattle. I'm talking about tens of thousands of heads of cattle. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just, it's the, the problem when you think about scale, it becomes quite different, becomes quite uh, complicated because one, just managing 10,000 heads of cattle or 50,000 heads of cattle mm-hmm. becomes different than having a, what we do is having a couple of dogs round up our, literally round up our cattle and, you know, putting them to the next pasture. So, and it can be done. It can be done. But it takes political agreement, the passing of laws that allow us to organize and mobilize the farmers in such a way that it can be done. And, of course, the farmers themselves have got to believe that doing doing farming this way is acceptable and actually will be productive. Mm-hmm. So it's it's difficult work, uh, to say the least. And we've, we've got a project, or we had a project, actually, in Senegal with uh, 80,000 80, hectares. That's uh, 160, 180,000 acres mm. and with tens of thousands of cattle from, from the local community. And the soil there is completely den- empty of nutrients. Mm-hmm. It's been exploited for so many years. So we were starting to use the cattle to actually replenish the soil and regenerate the soil. Mm-hmm. And their waste is what needs to be done. I see. Do you did you see good traction after the piece came out in Time Magazine? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think we've got a lot of people, not just individuals, but institutions, people who say we really would like uh, you know to understand this more and how can, for example, we had some ranchers coming in from Colorado and or calling us from Colorado and saying they had heard of some of this, mm-hmm. but somehow. Uh, to have a, a famous chef like Tom Colicchio <laughs> actually come in, yeah. you know, it just provides, you know, and I, and, and the, the, here's the thinking, right, from a financial point of view, says, you know, I, they say, I'm, I'm perhaps willing to do this, but will Tom link me to some buyers who will buy this kind of stuff? Wow. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, you know, as Steve knows, you know, the world goes round and the demand for, Either guests to through your restaurants, <laughs> or, mm-hmm. or people who buy real estate in Serenby. It all is driven by people who are committed to the values you've got and are prepared to put money down to buy it. If it doesn't happen, it's just talk. That's right. But you know, I, I think it things things are changing. I think you know, organic foods, uh, local food, yep. uh, are improving, but. You know, one of the real issues is, is our, our distribution system. And, and I read somewhere that 50% of the price of anything on our shelves is for the petroleum to get it to that plate. Yeah, right, 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 it's, right. It's, it's, it's this whole idea. If, if you have regional agriculture, then yeah. 50% can go directly to the producer or the people closer than, than this whole yeah. chain of distribution. And, and yeah. you know, we think this pandemic is awful, and it was, but our, our whole food system is just as fragile. Mm-hmm. It's very fragile. And if we don't return to a more regional uh, uh, system, both for our health, so that we're eating things that are in season, but also this whole issue of, uh, of distribution and where it's coming from. Yeah. No, I think local, local is important. Uh, and, again, I think we've just got to show – and as you know, um, you know the the, the, the well, farm, organic farming in Georgia is actually way behind the national average. Okay, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. the 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 opportunities are to actually grow that, and you know it, it all begins. It goes back to demand, Steve. Yes, will people be aware of the health benefits of what you just said of buying local, buying organic? Mm-hmm. Or near organic, or you know, minimal use of 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 of, uh, of uh, chemicals, etc., so that they are they are eating healthier. You know, the problem with health, the health message, is that it's not immediate, unlike a pill. You know, and and I've just I was talking to uh, the guy that runs our grassroots operation, our e-commerce, and I said, you know, 
the messaging that we have for for grassroots meats is terrific. And we show, for example, we show how uh, industrial chicken is actually dipped into chlorine to clean it up before it's sold and that kind of stuff. So that that message is that you're eating chlorinated chicken. Right. <laughs> Hopefully, people will say, Ew. "Right." I, you know, that kind of, something immediate is what turns Americans on, mm-hmm. not the long term. You know, I don't know. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting marketing problem. <laughs> Once they're exposed, I mean, if, if in markets, some that are starting to bring organic or fresh local, you look at the color difference, they start tasting no, absolutely. it. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that's why it's, it's really good. Yeah, it is. It's no doubt about it. You know, um, you know I, I'm, I'm going to tout grassroots again. Grassroots pork, okay. The texture of the pork right. is so much better than the industrial pork. Totally different. I mean, there's no comparison. Yeah. But who does a ta- you know who does a comparison taste off? Only wine soph- you know, sophisticates do that. Right. <laughs> Start looking at the colors. Well, yeah. with Rodale now uh, starting to operate in Georgia with their yeah. regional uh, research center, uh, they have real uh, goals to really change yeah, they do. Georgia. They to, do. To, uh, yeah. uh, to, to move that whole And, uh, you know, I've, I've actually been offered to join the board over there, the advisory board, and I, I have accepted. You know, and I think a lot of the conversation is going to be about demand. Who's going to buy this? I think at the right price. going to be there. We're, we're on the edge of this urban center with, you know, per yeah. 7 million people. It's just to expose them to them and figure out the distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not that old, that old form. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another thing that I think has come up during COVID is, um, you know, the food insecurity, not only obviously the um, the fragility of the system and, and sort of the distribution that we saw, but really the food insecurity that came up, like, you know, really seeing these long lines at food banks and so many children. Um, I think the article mentioned something like 14 million children in households with food insecurity. Um, and you had a quote in the article that said, and, and again, I'll, uh, I don't mean to be flippant, but it only takes $25 billion to end hunger in the U.S. And I use right. that number as a comparison to what we spend on other things. The so, military. <laughs> exactly. And so do you and Tom have ideas or, or you know, to sort of push in that direction as well? Or? Yeah, I, th- I think we're, we're part of a group that's going to, you know, we've just got, we've got a lobby. That's basically that's what we've got to do. Yep, yep. And um that's we got to, you know, and I think to actually lobby, I don't know, if, I don't, I, I know of a few reps and senators who are willing to say we spend too much on the military. It's starting to come out again. Mm-hmm. And people are saying, wow, this military budget is greater than, you know, all of the other countries' military spending right. combined mm-hmm. by far. Do we really need that much money? And, you know, and I, was it the F-35? You know, it's $1 trillion has been spent on it. It's not working well. Mm-hmm. Surely, surely. Anyway, I think the, the current uh, the current passage of the, the COVID bill mm-hmm. includes a lot of money for uh, for children. And if hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll end half of them, I think. I think the, the forecast is it'll end poverty and hunger for half the kids in the United States, which is great. Which is you incredible. Know, so somebody said, well, what about the other half? And I thought to myself, yeah, what about the other half? Well, we still have work to do. Um, Work to do. Well, and the other thing that I think you guys are working on is sort of the back to regenerative is the the soil health, right? And so when I actually talked to Jeff um, at Rodale the other day, and he was saying that they have a new, I don't know if it's 100% out, but they've been doing a new trial where they actually were denuding the soil. They were were trying to strip the soil or they actually were just... (laughs) planting um, in a traditional agricultural mode with the glyphosate and the chemicals. And, you know, even just after I think it was two years, the nutrient health of the vegetables coming out of the soil were a hundred times less full of minerals. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I mean it's no, it's uh, the, the, the soil that we use basically for agriculture is chemical. Mm-hmm. And the, qual- the quality of the food that comes out of it is just in- substantially inferior. Potentially inferior, but you know, people prefer to go to Whole Foods and go to the nutrient section, nutraceuticals, right. buy vitamins. You know, right. although. But what are you going to say? Steve? Our soapboxes on all these issues because it's so. I know <laughs> the majority of the country is moving in a different direction. 
and they are moving in a different direction. Well, and I think um, it's good to have these conversations. And um, if we can always, we always joke that we sort of slip in a little bit of awareness about these larger issues into the sort of the beauty and lifestyle of Serenby. But awareness of the benefits is the first step in order to create consumer demand, to your point. Yeah. Yeah, I think the pressure I mean, with Rodale working in Georgia around organic farming, you know, as farmers get involved, the, the local communities are going to know about it and they may be able to convert more and more people to organic or, or quality local produce. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not just demand. It's actually the supply can have an effect on demand. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are lots of people, uh, you know, one, one of the things that's got to be, we've got to find, Steve, is that the production of high quality foods that we find a way to keep the cost down. And, you know, we don't want to end up with 2,000 or 20,000 acre farms, but how do we keep that cost so people can afford to buy high quality local foods? Mm -hmm. so that's not, that's not insignificant. One thing is we need to restore the agrarian economy right now. Our yeah. Farms is a boutique farm where the farm itself has to do all those things. So, yeah, you know, we we need a system and develop jobs for other people to be the packagers and the yeah. packers, uh, yeah. and, and and to where we we utilize a hundred percent of what's being produced. So yeah. uh, imagine if we had someone coming in and buying all the seconds, all the all the pieces that get chopped, uh, all yeah. uh, all the vegetables that don't meet the beauty line that our our, our consumers now seem to want. And those can be put into soups and lasagnas and all kinds of second-level products. Absolutely. But our existing farmer can't do that. But no, they're busy farming. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> coming in, extending so that they're actually selling absolutely everything yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then no, and I think, market. again, restaurants, I think, is a good place to go to as well. They, they chop up a lot, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but there's yeah. still the distribution system is all selling the restaurants all the perfect the perfect thing. Of course, of course. So again, back to demand. You know, Tom Calicchio and lots of other, a lot of other chefs are saying you've got to utilize the whole farm. Right, mm -hmm. essentially, is your point. And um, it's growing. I mean, in New York, uh, the whole New York area is actually a thriving center of this kind of thinking and work and production. And you know, it's hard to find. I haven't been to New York in a while for obvious reasons. But I remember, uh, I remember a year ago you know, that. Uh, in most restaurants that I have been to in in, uh, in New York are farm to table or claim to be as farm to table as they can be. Mm -hmm. You know, that's huge in terms of the number of people that dine in New York. And, uh, and uh, people ask themselves the questions, you know, farm to table and they name the farm. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's it's. it's it's incredible what is happening. Well, also to uh, work with our universities, and I know Emory is committed. But the supply isn't there to meet yeah. the goal of, of commitment. So huge opportunity. I, I, so I'll tell you, I, I actually try to sell. This is years ago, so it may not be relevant today. But at Emory mm -hmm. University, I actually met with the procurement people, you know, the rest of the food people. And, yes, they were committed to buying local. But they were also committed to a low price. <laughs> because they have a budget, right? Okay. Those, those, those students don't have much money, and they have a, you know, the whole, I don't know how the whole system works anymore, but it was complicated. So they were, it was, it was tough to sell them because they wanted their tomatoes to be at, you know, two cents a pound or whatever the price mm -hmm. was at the time. So it was, well, the reality, the reality was, it was both the clash of economics and values. Well, and here's what we have to come up to find out what it is because, you know, we, we subsidize our, our soybean and our, our corn markets. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, and it isn't the end buyer that's paying the full price. No, and, no, no. Right now the end buyer on, on fruits and vegetables is paying the full price. So we, we've got to right. look at those systems too. And I think that's where Vilsec could actually have an impact. Right. Okay. Because he understands this very well. And shifting the uh, subsidies mm -hmm. away from the commodities towards what's healthier and local and everything else is something he could actually have an impact on. And then that will affect and, our health and, and it'll roll into yeah. a lot of the other. Uh, Absolutely. We'll put him in different columns maybe, but at the end of the day, we have a more balanced budget. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, you know, and, you know, I, I think with Biden, we've got, to me, it's a bit of a surprise. I mean, we've got a transformational president on our hands. 
with. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody who's willing to make some really tough choices that will benefit us all as opposed to benefiting the rich. Yeah. Well, I, and I, when I was working with the uh, Department of Community Affairs and in, in, in dealing with some of those folks in Georgia and, and came upon some uh, some papers that, you know, in 1940, our prisons were required to grow all their own food. Yeah. And most, most of these slaughterhouses still exist because it's th- th- they're buildings that can't be repurposed necessarily. And so unless they burn right. them down, a lot of times they still exist in their, you know, storerooms or something. So. Uh, yeah, and, yeah. and then there's other research that working in in, in dirt is one of the greatest uh, things to to uh, calm aggression down. So imagine what a program we could do in our prisons that totally has disappeared over these last seventy years. Yeah. Well, in high schools, you know, there's uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the uh, the other the other chef in uh, in in Oakland. Uh, the woman. Uh, Oh, what's her name? Alice Waters. Alice Waters. <laughs> Alice Waters has this uh, one acre program with high schools for yeah. exactly that purpose, mm-hmm. right? And, and that's a big program and, too in Georgia. And the Turner Foundation or the the um, Captain Planet Foundation is doing a lot with the yeah. gardens, uh, as well as the Children of Nature Network. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good happening out there, and I think it's always trying to figure out how we can continue to help. Um, as an individual or as um, a group to sort of come together and put pressure to, to sort of demand these changes um, on the larger level, as well as support the farmers on the local level. Yeah. So I think one of the first steps, uh, everyone is listening to this should make sure that they buy organic, make sure they buy from local farmers. That's a key uh, because these folks can't continue unless there is revenue coming into the farm. Uh, you know, to pay for all of the inputs uh, and the work that they do. Mm-hmm. So that's that's one obvious choice. Mm-hmm. And I, I would not assume that. You know, I think uh, all of us have the habit of going over to Kroger and, <laughs> and buying stuff that comes in from Peru, you know? Yeah. Well, I think when I first understood the the soil health to the vegetable health, you know, or to the, to the people health. Um, and I really started to understand that with Rodale and the soil, just seeing what mm-hmm. organic soil looks like versus conventional soil oh, yeah. We yeah. really made a huge change. And we were already pretty good. Um, I think having kids made us more aware, um, mm-hmm. but that made us really seek out organic and, or, you know, we just didn't buy if we couldn't find it. And, and you know, we're lucky that like, you know, Costco and Walmart and people are buying or, you know, providing organic. It It is mm-hmm. more available these days. It isn't just have to be at Whole Foods. Yeah, no, that's true. Mm-hmm. It is changing. It has changed a lot. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, Vilsec, Vilsec has got a key component to that. And we'll be we'll be lobbying him, uh, especially on the local farm level to actually provide uh, the right subsidies. So that, uh, you know, shift the subsidies away from the large corporate entities into local farms, local mm-hmm. activities. And uh, and I think he's willing to do that. I mean, I, I, it, the, the political environment, talk about, you know, the big stick and the big money comes from the big corporations, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just not beat about the bush. That's the way it's come. True. But I think that's why I was saying about I think Biden is a transformational president is that he's willing to give all that up. And said, yeah. I don't want to listen to you mm-hmm. because you're actually harming the environment and mm-hmm. you're harming people and you're harming also animals. You know, yeah. the, 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 the process by which they treat animals is just horrendous, both in terms of growing them and processing them. Yeah. And I think that even um, movies like Kiss the Ground that had come out recently yeah. is mm-hmm. helpful. So, you it's know, flowing. you can't discount the um, the celebrity um, behind a particular topic to raise awareness, mm-hmm. um, especially when they have all of the wonderful um, data points to support it. But back to Heifer, um, is there a way that we can support you? Like what what would be the best way for us? I mean, obviously money is always a way, but but like the Christmas <laughs> gift, you know, that that I that we yeah. gave, tell us a little bit about some of the best ways to give and support um, the Heifer Project. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So we have a catalog, which a lot of other nonprofits have as well. And mm-hmm. in that catalog, you've got all sorts of gifts, ideas, you know, but yeah. mostly oriented towards livestock. Yeah. So that's what we do. And so 
I'll not say that if you buy a goat out of, out of the catalog, that necessarily a goat will go to a farmer. But we will <laughs> use it in a way that you know will promote the livelihood uh, of farmers somewhere. Right. Um, so that's one way to do it. Mm-hmm. The uh, you know, there's, I'm not going to get into the economics of nonprofit, which is pretty arcane. But most nonprofits in the United States depend on the amazing generosity of Americans donors in November, late November and December. Mm-hmm. So I, I keep telling my staff, I said, you know, it's like being in the in the champagne business, which if you don't have a great New Year's Eve, you've had a <laughs> terrible year. And right. I said, I, I really don't like that. I used to be in the in wine and liquor business, actually, when I was with Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's a terrible way to, to run a business. You know, what you want is steady monthly good quality you know, demand so that yep. you've got a steady cash flow. So if you're in the champagne business, you don't have that. You have a little peak in, you know, during wedding time, and then you have this huge sale month in December. Okay. So we've got monthly donor programs. Mm-hmm. And that's not specifically oriented towards a particular animal, but it can be oriented to a project. Mm-hmm. If you go to our website, you can get a description of the project. You can give to a project or you can say, you know what? I trust these people. I think they'll use the money right. But it helps us a lot to have a continuous monthly donation. That's it wonderful. doesn't have to be big, you know, $10, mm-hmm. $20, whatever it is. Um, but that, I'll tell you, my chief financial officer would kiss me right now for <laughs> saying this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll put a link specifically to the catalog and with that okay. wonderful idea. And I'm actually on the website right now and there is a fabulous, I don't know what, what with maybe a llama. I might take that photo and put it up too. It's a beautiful llama uh, great, photo. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, Llamas uh, are wonderful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Parkas are wonderful. They're, mm-hmm. they're interesting animals to say the least. Yeah. Well, Pierre, one of the last things we like to ask is um, share with us um, what you might um, tell somebody who doesn't know about CRMB or they're maybe coming down for the day. Day, um, what would be sort of your advice to them or something oh, that yes. might be good I, to well, share? I, I absolutely have my, my elevator speech. Oh, wonderful. I didn't know you were going to ask that question, but I haven't. <laughs> so my my recommendation to them is said, okay, it's a beautiful, pristine area. You know, you've got, you've got the stables, you've got the farm, you've got the inn. I said, but the power of Serenby is to go into the forest and what the Japanese call forest bathing. Mm -hmm. All right, just be in the forest. And uh, so I would encourage, and I'm going to do that personally on a a personal basis, to have have, uh, AHOA actually put in more benches in the forest so that people can go sit and just be with the forest, you know, and literally just enjoy the, the, the sights, the trees, listen for the animals. That is what I recommend. That's why, you know, my my house, I literally can trip over my fence and I'm in the forest. Yep. Which is one of the reasons I bought we bought this house and yeah. uh, just love the forest. Yeah. And my dog loves the forest. And I will publicly confess that I let my dog off the leash. <gasps> oh, Sorry. don't don't tell the HOA. I know. I know. <laughs> They'll come after my you. Dog, my dog loves it, so. I know, I know. <laughs> well, Pierre, thank you so much. Um, we oh. so appreciate your time. I could sit and talk to you for hours. I think we have um, some great ideas and work to do together, all of us. But um, it's been a Good. pleasure. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thank you. Hi, Steve. We're delighted you're in Serbia and uh, look forward to all the work we're going to do on Absolutely. several Absolutely. We're on several fronts. Yeah, that's well, right. I plan I plan to be carried out of my house feet first, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You have right. another 40 years to get another some of this Another 40 years down. to go. That's right. Yes, right. We'll, we'll find a place in the forest for you. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, yeah. well, we'll look into it. All right. Be good. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank Take you, care. guys. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Serenby Stories. New episodes are available on Mondays. Please follow us and leave us a five-star review and visit our website to learn more about guests, episodes, and everything Serenby at serenbystories.com. This episode is supported by the Inn at Serenby, nestled in the rolling countryside of the bucolic community of Serenby, where guests can walk on the 15 miles of private trails through preserved forest land, the wildflower meadow, and the animal village. 
Relax at the pool, hot tub, or in rocking chairs on a wraparound porch. Play on the croquet lawn, grab a canoe, and jump on the in-ground trampoline. Connect with nature and each other, all while staying in a luxurious space at the inn at Serenby. Book your stay today at serenbyinn.com. S-E-R-E-N-B-E-I-N-N dot com.